Well, good morning to all of you. Welcome to World Outreach Church. Those here in this room, those in the other arenas, and those watching online. And if you're watching from home or from your hotel room or wherever you are, we just want you to come right into this room with us, as it were, and worship today. It's our custom to have a prayer signifying our offering. There's different ways of giving here, but we want to offer our prayers to the Lord and to pray for our nation. The Bible says that the church is to be a house of prayer for all nations. And all of us know these are difficult times and that this nation, our leaders, our state, our government, and our people need the prayers of God's holy people as they gather. So I'd like to ask you to stand with me and let's go to the Lord together this morning as we pray. <clears throat> our almighty God and our heavenly Father, we thank you because you are so faithful and trustworthy that it is sweet for us to trust in you. It is wonderful for us to take you at your word, to know that you're the unchanging God, that before the mountains were brought forth or ever the earth and the world was formed, that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And you are our savior a Redeemer, one that we can come to and approach with confidence to find grace to help us in our time of need. And Father, we pray now for those leaders of the kingdoms of the world that are trying to find their place to establish peace or to conduct war, whatever it is they are seeking to do, may they increasingly recognize that you are the Lord, the sovereign creator of heaven and earth, and that they need to be submissive to you. We pray, Lord, for your persecuted church all over the world, that you would strengthen those who are languishing and who are oppressed right now. And Father, for our own nation, we need an awakening and a revival such as you have sent before. We read about the revivals in the Old Testament. We know what happened on the day of Pentecost. We read about the first great awakening that paved the way for our nation to come into existence with the revival fires of the 1700s. We know about the second great awakening and the revival that swept over America in the early 1800s. Lord, there have been these periodic revivals in our nation, and now we see some signs of it with baptisms in California and with revivals and awakenings on college campuses. We ask you, Lord, to fan the flames and to send to our nation another awakening that will allow, allow our people to rejoice in you. As it says in the Bible, Lord, will you not revive us again that we may rejoice in you? We pray that this would sweep into many campuses and that this church and each of our lives would spark the flames that help it to grow. And Father, as we gather here today, May our own hearts and spirits be revived by your Holy Spirit. Will you speak to us? Let me be, as it were, out of the way, and you, as it were, speaking today is our prayer together. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We have had interesting weather this year, and... Some months ago, we had winds at my house that I thought was as close to a hurricane as anything I've ever seen. And I live sort of on a crest of a hill in Donaldson, and the wind just sweeps up the road and hits my house and makes it shake. And so we had this tremendous windstorm, and I looked out, and I had some little evergreens about six feet, seven feet tall, and they were just bent over, almost parallel to the ground, and then they would spring back up and another gust would come, and I just watched them go back and forth for a while. I was so intrigued, I took a videotape. And then the storm passed, and I went out to see if there were other, if there was some damage done, and I had two large pine trees that had completely been blown over, their roots were sticking up, 
I haven't cut them up yet because I'm waiting for the nesting season to be finished with the birds, but they're good now for nothing but firewood. And I took a lesson from that, and I said, Lord, help me to be like those well-grounded, flexible trees that can stand firm even in the storm. And that's what I want to talk about today is the phrase in the Bible that says, stand firm. Now, that really is the key to the book of Philippians. I've preached a great deal from Philippians here in the past year or so. I've just poured myself into Philippians, and I've written a book that will be out next year on this little book of the Bible, Philippians, only four chapters, but it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I did a series of podcasts on it, and I'm convinced that the theme of the book of Philippians is that we must stand firm. And you can see that in the very outline of the book. So as you are reading through Philippians, you read through verses 1 through 26 and its introduction. And Paul is saying, uh, greetings to you, here's what's going on in my life, and here's how I'm reacting to it. But then in verse 27, he begins the body of his book. And he says, whatever happens, I want you to stand firm. That's the way that he puts it. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you are standing firm. And that's the key. Now, a lot of people think the theme of Philippians is joy. And there's a lot of joy in Philippians. But that is a sub-theme. Primarily, Paul was warning the Philippians, whatever happened, to stand firm. And then in chapter 2, he gave them the example of Jesus Christ. He said, Jesus stood firm. Though he was in essence God, he didn't consider it necessary to hang on to the prerogatives of his deity, but he made himself as nothing, emptied himself, and became a servant, and died for us and rose again, and God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. So be like Jesus. And then he talked about Epaphroditus, and he said, this man that you sent to me, and he brought a gift. He is worthy of emulating, stand firm the way that he does. And then later in chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, he talks about Timothy. He says, Timothy has served me like a son in the gospel, and stand firm like him. And then in chapter 3, Paul says, and stand firm like me. I could boast about many things, he says. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, a tribe of the Benjamins. But he said, all of those things are lost compared to the excellency of knowing Christ. And he said, I am striving, forgetting what lies behind, towards the goal of what lies ahead. So stand firm like me. Follow my example, he said, as I follow the example of Christ. So that's the body of the book. I mean, at the beginning of the book of Philippians, he has some introductory remarks, and then he gives us his theme, whatever happens, I want you to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and stand firm. And then in chapter 2, like Christ, like Epaphroditus, like Timothy, in chapter 3, like I am. And then he ends in chapter 4, verse 1, by saying, so dear friends, this is how you stand firm in the Lord. And the rest of the chapter then is his concluding remarks. So the great theme is to stand firm like these trees that are well-rooted and are not going to be blown by the winds of the world coming against them. So I was very interested as I found that to see what else the Bible has to say about standing firm. And so I searched out that phrase in the Bible, and you would not believe how often the Bible tells us to stand firm. And I've chosen 12 different passages, including here the one in Philippians, to share with you because this tells us it's just a sampling of what the Bible says. I could do a whole series of sermons on the subject of standing firm using that phrase as it occurs in different parts of the Bible. But I want to show you some of the others just in a brief way today, beginning with 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Now, here's the background of that. 
when Paul established the church in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, it was a lot of space was devoted to that story in the book of Acts, but he was eventually driven out of town and he went to Thessalonica and there he established a church, but he was only there for three or four weeks and then he was driven out of town again and he was so concerned that he had not had enough time to disciple the people and to help them to become deeply rooted and grounded in Christ that he sent Timothy back to see how those Thessalonian Christians were doing. So he says in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 6, Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us good news about your faith and love. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith, for now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. We really live because we have heard that you are standing firm in the Lord. I think all of us who are parents can relate to this. Paul thought of the Thessalonians as his children. And what is it that helps a parent to really live if his children are standing firm in the Lord? I put in a few fence posts in my life, and there's two ways of doing it. I like a wooden fence post. And you can dig a hole and put it in the ground and put the dirt around it. Or, that wasn't the fence post there. I was, uh, that's the way it sounded when I beat it. <laughs> or, you can, or you can concrete it in. You know, you can mix the cement and pour it in there. And once you do that, then it's going to stay there for a long time. The others get wobbly over time. Have you ever been walking through the woods and you come across an old fence and the fence posts out of wood are just wobbly? Well, we need to be concreted in. We need to be submitted in. We need to be absolutely standing firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. Like those fence posts that will not move, we've got to stand firm in the Lord. <laughs> Never moved. Unmovable, the Bible says. And then we've got to stand firm in the liberty of Christ. In Galatians chapter 5, now... Galatians is a very interesting book because Paul had evangelized this area known as Galatia, which is in modern-day Turkey, and then some false teachers had come in, and they had said that, you know, what Paul was saying wasn't true. It's not just a matter of receiving Christ as Savior. You also have to follow the Jewish traditions if you're going to live for Christ. And Paul said, they are taking away your liberty. So he said in, verse, uh, in chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In other words, he is saying that we need to be free from anything that would enslave us, pull us down, distract us, or weaken our Christian life. We need to be free from the fear of men. We need to be free from needless regulations. We need to be free from the Judaizing influence of adding things to our salvation. It is vital for us in this day, for this church and all of the other churches that are worshiping today, to hold firmly to the apostolic faith that was given to us by the apostles and has been passed down to us, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should perish. So it's very important for us to stand firm in the liberty we have in Christ. And then closely related to that, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, or 16 rather, be on your guard Stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. We stand firm in our faith. You know, there was a time very early in my ministry when I was pastoring out in the country, a little stone church, lovely, lovely place and beautiful people and a great beginning for one's preaching and pastoring ministry. But I went through a period of time when I wondered about the credibility of Christianity. And I would preach to the people and go home and say to myself, is that really true? Can I demonstrate the truth of Christianity? 
So I began doing research and studying the area that we call apologetics, which has to do with the reliability of the Christian faith. And the more I studied, the more convinced I became that it is harder not to believe in Christianity than it is to believe in Christianity because there is overwhelming evidence in multiple fields and areas for the credibility of the Bible. And my faith has just continued growing since then. I've investigated Christianity from every angle, and I can say to you, it is reliable, it is trustworthy, historically, philosophically, psychologically, prophetically, trustworthy, archaeologically, scientifically, and in terms of the sublime humanitarianism that it has brought to the world, you can trust the Bible. You can stand firm in your faith. And if you have questions, there are answers, and there are good answers, and I would encourage you to go into this whole area of apologetics and doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs, and don't make the mistake of doubting your beliefs and believing your doubts. Let's stand firm in the faith, and then the Bible tells us to stand firm clad in the armor of God, and this is the book of Ephesians. Last night I explained that Ephesians really has three different parts to it, and the historic outline that other people have used is chapters 1, 2, and 3 talk about our wealth, how rich we are in Jesus, and I dealt with that theme last night. And then chapters 4, 5, and the first part of chapter 6 has to do with our walk. And in the older translations that are more literal, it says walk in love and walk in the Spirit and walk circumspectfully and walk wisely and don't walk the way the world does. That word occurs over and over again. And then in the last part of chapter 6, the ending of the book is all about our warfare. It is about spiritual warfare. So Ephesians is our walk, our wealth, our walk, and our warfare. And in the warfare, Paul said... Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Now look at this. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth around your waist. In other words, you are living out the truth. It is around you. The truth of Scripture the truth that we see in the Bible, the truth that is all the way through the pages of this wonderful book. You are to stand firm with the truth around your waist. Thank you. Apparently, apparently I am the cause of the problem. <laughs> you are to stand firm with the truth around your waist so that everybody can see it and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, that means that you are living a right life. When you are living a right life, the devil has a hard time getting to you because he often gets to us through those areas of neglect or those areas of carelessness when we allow bad habits to come into our lives. And so, when you live righteously, that is a protection for you spiritually, and so you got to have the breastplate of righteousness, and then your feet fitted with the preparation that comes from the gospel of peace. So as you go hither and yon, wherever you go, you are sharing Christ with other people, the gospel that brings peace to the world. And then it says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. So, here's the way that works. The evil one will say to you, you know, that's a real problem, and it's going to come back, and it's going to haunt you. This is going to destroy your life. This problem is going to be your destruction, and you got to say, but God has given me promises. And he says that everything is going to work together for good those, to those who love the Lord, as we heard earlier. Uh, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will help thee. I will strengthen thee, I will uphold thee with my righteous hand. You find those promises, you hold them up, and they come between you and the fiery darts of the wicked one. That is the shield of faith. It is when you take the promises of God, you wrap them around you, and the devil cannot get through the promises of God. He extinguishes those fiery darts. The Lord does by the shield of faith that he gives to you. 
And then he says, take the helmet of salvation. And in a cross-reference, Paul talks about the helmet of the hope of our salvation. This has to do with the optimism that comes into our lives because of the tremendous sense of joy as we anticipate the future. And then he says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You go out every day with the Bible foremost in your mind, Bible verses at the top of your thoughts. And when you are shielded from the devil by the armor that God gives you, then you can stand firm against all of his attacks. Now, he knows how to attack us, but he cannot get through the God-assigned armor that is given to us. And so we are to stand firm, clad in the armor of God. And then fifthly, and very closely related to that, we stand firm against the devil and his schemes. His schemes. The devil is always scheming. And I believe in the devil. The Bible talks about a devil and about all of his minions. And we do not know all of the spiritual warfare happening in the heavenly places. And if we did, it would probably frighten us. But the Lord is in control. And we've got to stand against the devil's schemes. We can resist him, not through our own personalities or our own righteousness or our own ability to live rightly or our own power over the authorities, but it's by the blood of Jesus Christ, nothing but the blood of Christ. And we stand firm, covered with the blood of Christ, and resist the devil. He cannot get through the curtain of the blood of Christ. He cannot get through the armor God has given to you. He has a hard time getting through a righteous, hopeful Christian. And so we stand firm against the devil and his schemes. And then sixthly, we stand firm in the Scriptures. Second Thessalonians. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you whether by word of mouth or by letter. How do we stand firm? By holding fast to these teachings, which means that we need to be reading the Bible every day. I hope you have a time and a way of reading the Bible every single day, just setting a few minutes aside and beginning where you left off yesterday. And you know, it's good for couples to read the Bible together and for families. I believe in family devotions. I don't know that I was so good about conducting them when I was a father, and my parents were not so good at conducting them. But Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And these teachings that I'm giving you today are to be upon your hearts. Teach them to your children and talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the way, when you come in, when you go out, just talk about them and write them on the doorpost of your house and put them on the walls of your home. Well, this tells us that the primary place where a child soaks up the wonder of God's Word is in the home. Now, it also tells us it should be natural. You know, it's not like we are having a church service every day with our children. It's the living out of the Christian environment every day in the home. There's something that I've tried to do that may help this a little bit. Um, every morning I put a 59-second sermon on my social media, and I tell people just go there and watch it together as a couple, just less than a minute. Watch it as a family. Watch it when you take your kids into bed, and then just uh, uh, talk about it a little bit, and then have prayer. And, you know, that's a very simple way to get beginning. I've been in Europe for the last three weeks. So I taped a whole series of 59-second sermons from Second Timothy with Europe as a background. And I'm just simply trying to get people to get into the Scripture. But it takes more than 59 seconds a day. It takes a life committed to holding fast to the teachings that have been passed on to us by the Word of God. And then ninthly, or whatever number it is, I've lost count, we have to stand firm in a hostile world. Now, we are living, and Christians always have, by the way, in a hostile world. 
But here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. When the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. There's our phrase. And we have to make a conscious decision to do it. I know your pastor, and he and we are not easily intimidated by the evil in our world. And this is no time for Christians to be intimidated. I read the other day about a lady named Lindsay Barr, who's an assistant teacher for a school system in another county. And she found out that her children were going to be read a book in the library that was sexually explicit and inappropriate. And she asked that her children be excused. And when that request went up the line, she was fired for being an assistant teacher. But there were some Christian attorneys. And they represented her. She was reinstated. And here is what the school superintendent said. He wrote her a letter. He said, upon returning, we encourage you as a parent to raise concerns with us about material being taught to your children. Raising such concerns does not preclude employment in our district. For the future, we are focused on the value you add across the district as a substitute teacher. We sincerely regret that your separation from the school district caused any distress. We have got to stand up. for the constitutional rights that we have as American citizens. They may not last forever. Persecution may come, but we cannot be easily intimidated. We've got to stand firm. On the island of Crete, there is an olive tree that is said to be the oldest tree on earth. We can prove that it goes, scientists can prove that it goes back at least 2,000 years, but they suspect that it goes back 4,000 years, which would be back to the time of Abraham. And people come from all over the world to see this tree, and (laughs) you can buy a little bottle of olive oil from its branches in the gift shop. (laughs) Well, Psalm 92 says that those who stand firm in their righteousness are like trees planted in the courtyard of their God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. So whatever our age, we ought to be able to stand firm and bear fruit. And listen to this again in Psalm 92. There's something interesting here. It says that the righteous will flourish like a tree planted in the courts of their God, They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, the Lord is my rock. He is my rock. We are trees, and we say, he is my rock. That's Psalm 92, the very last part of the psalm. What does that refer to? Do you see the metaphors there? We are trees, and our roots go down And beneath us, there is a solid rock, and our roots grip that rock, and we cannot be removed. That's the idea there. That's the picture, and that's the way we stand firm. Colossians talks about being rooted and grounded in Christ. So when our roots go down deep and they cling to the rock, it's very hard for the winds of the world to blow us over. We are able to stand firm. And then Exodus tells us to stand firm in times of danger. This is the story of the Israelites at the Red Sea. And they're being pursued by Pharaoh. You know the story probably very well. I wrote a book about it called The Red Sea Rules, how Pharaoh came chasing after them. And they were trapped. They were exactly where God had told them to be. But they were there in a place that was impossible for them. Sometimes when you follow the Lord, you find yourself in a place that is absolutely impossible, humanly speaking, but the Lord has a plan. And so the Israelites saw the Egyptians coming. They were full of fear. They couldn't go forward without drowning. They couldn't go backwards. They were about to be annihilated. And this is what the Lord said, do not be afraid, stand firm. And you'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring today. Now, you can take that verse and put your name in it if you're facing some kind of existential danger 
or you're having a bunch of problems that are weighing down upon you, then put your name there. The Lord says, do not be afraid. Stand firm. You'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring. I'm going to make for you a way. I know what I'm doing. I am in charge of all of this. Don't be afraid. Just trust me. Stand firm and watch what I'm going to do. Isn't that a wonderful word? And there's a very similar word in Second Chronicles, and it's a very similar story. This is the story of Jehoshaphat, and he was the king of Jerusalem and of all of Judah. He was a good man, and suddenly he got word that there was a million-man army, a coalition of three nations coming against them, only a day's march away. There was nothing they could do to defend themselves, and suddenly the whole city of Jerusalem recognized that within 24 hours, they would all be put to the sword. And Jehoshaphat prayed a wonderful prayer. He said, Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And the Lord sent back this message through a prophet. He said in verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, for the Lord will be with you. There is another verse. You can put your name in it. Maybe you're surrounded right now, and you feel overwhelmed, and you are saying like Jehoshaphat, Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. The Lord has this verse for you. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Anyone here discouraged? Do not be discouraged. Go out and face whatever it is, and the Lord will be with you. And then number 10, the Bible tells us to stand firm to the very end. Jesus said, you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The end of what? Well, the end of whatever it is. It might be our life. We may not live until Jesus comes again. He may take us home, but we stand firm until the very moment when he takes us home. Or it may be when he comes again. It may be the rapture of the church. Whatever it is, the duration of time that we are on this earth, we're to stand firm until the Lord takes us off of it. Now, that's going to be a day of rejoicing. What a day of rejoicing that will be. The Bible says to live as Christ and to die as gain. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said, you'll be with me always. But until that time comes, we stand firm and endure until the end. And finally, we stand firm knowing that our work is not in vain. This is one of the go-to verses that I've had through the years in my ministry. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be strong and steadfast, always abounding, standing firm, because you know that your work in the Lord is not in vain. Nothing that you do for the Lord will be in vain. I've been a pastor of a very small church in my early days. Sometimes I would preach and think I'm not doing any good. All through these years, there have been times when I've been discouraged because we often don't see the results of what we're doing for the Lord. But then I've come back to this promise And I don't work because I see the results. I work because the Lord promises the results will come in His timing if I am faithful to Him. And that's the way it is for us in the Lord's work. I have a friend named Bobby Jackson. He was an evangelist for many years. He's 91, 90 or 91 now, and he still can preach a good 45-minute message from memory with every word clearly articulated. He doesn't get as many invitations now, he tells me, but... He's had a life of traveling on the road from city to city and town to town. And I was talking to him the other day, and he said, sometimes, you know, he says, I think I didn't do any good. He said, I went to one little town, and they had a blizzard the week that I was scheduled to preach there. And only about five or six people came. They braved the snow, and they walked, or they put the chains on the tire, and they made it to the church. And and I would preach to that little group of five or six people, and 
and I would give the invitation, and I would do my best, but nobody seemed moved. And at the end of the week, I went on to another city, and I thought, well, that was the waste of a whole week. I didn't do any good there. And 25 years later, he said, I was speaking at a camp, and a young man came up to me who was a pastor of a church that had brought his children to that camp and said, do you remember the week that you came and it snowed real heavy and there was only a few people there in such and such a town? <clears throat> and Bobby said, I remember it very well. I left thinking I hadn't done any good that week. And he said, well, you did. I was a 10-year-old boy sitting there, and as you preached, I received Christ as my Savior. And that's the way the Lord works. We often don't see the results until later, maybe not until we get to heaven. But the promise is <clears throat> that if you're working in the nursery, if you're teaching the children, if you're working with teenagers, if you're raising kids, whatever it is the Lord calls on you to do, maybe some ministry outside of the church, but whatever it is, you cannot do it without the Lord blessing it if you do it in His will. And so we stand firm in the work of the Lord knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, all of that is from the Bible. But let me end by giving you some words from Christian history. You know, I'm a lover of books. When I was growing up, when I was a little boy, my dad, he never got me into sports. I guess he knew I was hopeless at it anyway. He could just look at me and say, we're not going to put that boy in sports. But they would buy me books. And I remember I learned to read sitting in my dad's lap and going through little books, and my, the first book I ever read was a little children's dictionary, A through Z, and he was so patient. He would let me sound out the words until I finally got it, and, and so now I've got a whole house full of books. If you came to my house, there's books on almost every wall, and now I can't buy anymore. I have to get them on Kindle because I don't have anywhere else to put them, but a whole row of my library shelves is devoted to biography. I love biography. And recently, I read the story of Ignatius and Polycarp. These were two men very early in Christian history who knew the apostle John. They were his disciples. They were a link back to the apostles, and they were both martyred for their faith. And Ignatius wrote to Polycarp as he was being taken to Rome to be killed. And this is what he said to him, one man to another. He said, stand firm, Polycarp, as does an anvil which is beaten. It is part of the noble athlete to be wounded and yet to conquer. And especially we ought to bear all things for the sake of God, that he may also bear with us. Be ever more zealous than you are. Weigh carefully the times and look to him who is above all time, eternal and invisible. Well, Polycarp took that to heart, and when he was 86 years old, they came to kill him. And they asked him to recant his faith, but he said, for 80 and six years I've served the Lord. I'm not going to leave him now. And they killed him as well. But that was the phrase, stand firm. And then Augustine, or Augustine, who came a little bit later, wrote in his confessions, Lord, you are a stronghold in my refuge. Let me flee to you that I may grow strong in every respect where I have grown weak in myself. The grace of Christ makes me stand firm and immovable. And then John Knox, the great Reformation hero of Scotland, someone wrote about him, his biographer, if Knox, as a young man, had sneaked through trials the easiest way, he would never have had the strength in his prime to defy and to rebuke the queen. It was by practicing the good habit of standing firm in small things against small people that he got the grace to stand firm in great things before great people. And then my hero Charles Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers of Victorian England, said, we must not yield we dare not yield if we are citizens of the great king. The martyr's cry to us is to stand 
firm. The cloud of witnesses bending from their thrones above beseech us to stand firm. All of the hosts of the shining ones cry to us, stand firm, stand firm for God and for the truth and for holiness and don't let anyone take your crown. And then one more quote from Billy Graham. He said, Satan will do everything he can to divert us from the message of Scripture, but we must stand firm. God has spoken, and we must be faithful to that message. Our generation, especially in the West, occupied itself with criticism of the Scripture and all too soon found itself questioning divine revelation. Do not make that mistake. Take the Bible as God's holy word. I find... This is what Billy Graham said. I find that the Bible becomes a flame in my hands, a flame that melts the hearts of people and moves them to decide to follow Christ. So I want to appeal to you to stand firm against the winds of the world, against the schemes of the devil. Just stand firm. It says in 2 Corinthians 2.21, now it is God who makes both us and you to stand firm in Christ. So we're facing very difficult days, but we do have the capacity as God helps us to stand firm. I remember, I'm old enough to remember the Falklands War when Margaret Thatcher sent the armies of Britain against the Falklands. And she famously told George Bush, the senior Bush, when he wasn't too sure about continuing in the fight, she said, George, this is no time to go wobbly. Do you remember that? Very famous quote. She said, George, this is no time to go wobbly. I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, this is no time for us to go wobbly. We must stand firm in the faith for Jesus Christ. And if you don't know him as your Savior, then this is the very time to receive him. You say, how do I do that? Well, you simply pray to him. You say, Lord, I believe that you died and rose again. It says in Romans chapter 10 that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. So you simply say, Lord, I've not been living the way that I've wanted to live, and I certainly haven't been living the way that you want me to live, but I'm willing now to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life, confessing my sins and inviting him to take control Help me to find the kind of life that I've been looking for all these years. And he'll come into your life. He'll come into your heart. And the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And you can make that decision today. If you're at home watching online or wherever you are, you can find a place, kneel down, and make Jesus Christ your Savior, and then let us know so we can help you. If you're in one of the other arenas or you're in this arena, you can, you can do it. You can pray and say, Lord, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want him to be number one. I want him to be the driver of everything I do from this point on. And suddenly, you'll be fresh, you'll be new, a new start, a new beginning, and you'll be washed in the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save you. And then we'll have some people up here at the front, and if you'd like to pray or get some counseling or get some encouragement, then pastors will be up here, and you are welcome to come and to talk to us afterwards. But make that decision for the Lord, and let's all make the decision that regardless of how hard the wind blows or the devil threatens or the problems come, we will stand firm, rooted and grounded in Christ, our roots clinging to the rock until the Lord comes to take us home, and then we'll have the victory. Will you bow your heads with me, and let's stand together for our closing prayer. Dear Lord, I pray today for any and all who may need Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord. May they not escape the lure, the appeal, the drawing of the Holy Spirit, but may they open their hearts and find Him at this moment as their Lord and Savior, confessing their sins, repenting, and turning to You in faith and obedience. And Lord, for all of us in this time, 
for our children, our grandchildren, for our families. Lord, give us a real determination in our hearts to stand firm for you, not being wobbly, never wavering, but unmovable in Christ. And now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great Savior of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip us all with everything good for doing your will and work in us what is pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.